Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. It's 7 p.m., so let's get started. Uh, my name is Paul Ligeti, and I am the Vice President of the Historical Society of West Windsor, which is a nonprofit founded in 1983 to preserve and promote our town's history. It's uh, wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, hopefully you're all here to see the lecture on New Jersey's and by extension West Windsor's original residence called the Lenny Lenape. Our speaker tonight is Professor Richard Veit, Professor of Anthropology and Interim Dean of, dean of Monmouth University School of Humanities and Social Sciences. He is a preeminent expert in the fields of New Jersey archeology span and indigenous history. Uh, this lecture is just one of several dozen events that the Historical Society is planning to commemorate West Windsor's 225th birthday this year. Throughout 2022, our year 225 planning committee will be working with a variety of local organizations to oversee events such as this lecture, reenactments, history tours, and much more. At the link shown here at the very bottom of the screen, you can learn much more about our upcoming plans, how to join our planning committee, and how to provide support as an individual institutional sponsor. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Donna Luparelli for helping to sponsor this lecture. Uh, we also have a variety of ongoing historic preservation and education projects that will be announced later this year, such as permanent signage in West Windsor historic communities, permanent art installations, and even a West Windsor history book. So I encourage everyone to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and take note of our website, which is a great resource to learn about local history and how to join and support us. Uh, please check in on all three sites for routine updates on our projects and events. Also, we're now selling year 225 memorabilia, which you can purchase to support the Historical Society and show off your township pride. In addition to various clothing and magnets, we also have mugs, which are produced by Unified Spectrum, a local group that employs and empowers neurodivergent community members. We are also just beginning to sell flags to hang outside your houses, and you know that's a new update on the shop now. Uh, finally, some things to point out about this meeting. Your microphones are disabled. However, you will be able to ask questions using the Zoom chat function, which is the little speech bubble icon usually found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, click on that to ask questions, uh, including those you want to ask Professor Veit. Uh, Maggie Walsh, who is our community outreach lead, and I are available to answer any you know, tech support questions. And if you can't use the chat for whatever reason, whether or not it's tech support or for asking questions to Professor Veit, uh, you can also send us an email at the email that you see at the center of the screen here. Um, we will have a question and answer session after the lecture where Maggie and I will read off the questions you post in the chat. Uh, so to whatever extent you can, please give Professor Veit a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Veit, for being here and take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Paul. Let me um, make sure we're sharing our screen here and we'll get, we'll get started. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing yours and bring up mine. All right, so uh, thank you all for coming out this evening uh, virtually. And Paul, thanks for that very warm welcome. And I'm really honored to be uh, speaking with all of you this evening about New Jersey's native people, our indigenous people, uh, the Lenape, and providing really a brief overview of a 12,000 plus year history, an incredible history, as I hope you'll, you'll learn and agree. So when we study New Jersey's distant past, and this is not to say that uh, Native Americans, indigenous people are not present in New Jersey today, they most certainly are. We have both federally and state recognized uh, tribal nations in the state. But when we go back, to look at the very distant history, we have a series of disparate sources that we can, we can draw upon as uh, scholars and people interested in the past. So we have art, uh, both art produced in the past and more recent uh, pieces of art, and I'll talk about this uh, painting in just a minute. Uh, we have archeology, span the physical evidence that people left behind uh, showing the activities that they engaged in during their day-to-day -day lives, often very powerful reminders of the things that they were doing. We have oral traditions, the traditions that are passed down in families and lineages, generation after generation. And you may think of these in kind of a small way, the sorts of stories that perhaps we retell at the holidays with family and friends. Uh, we have a pretty rich body of historic documents, many of which are at the State Archives in Trenton, 
New Jersey that reflect things like land sales and treaties uh, with Native American populations. And then in some ways, perhaps uh, most interestingly, we have what we call experimental archeology. span And this is where modern day archeologists try to replicate ancient technologies and see how well uh, they succeed when using those technologies. So uh, let me talk a little bit about this uh, painting as an example of art. So this shows a Native American creation story. And it's based loosely on Algonquin or Lenape creation stories and also Iroquoian creation stories further to the north and New York State. And in those stories, the first person was a woman who descended to Earth from a different, higher plane. And that's why she's sort of here uh, in this light area with darkness all around her. As she was coming down from this tree, sometimes called a tree of wisdom in the sky, uh, the birds and the animals in the water saw her falling and they wanted to, uh, to catch her and to ease her fall. And you can see she's landed here on the back of the strongest animal, the animal that caught her, a turtle. Um, and then the fish and the beavers and the crayfish are all bringing earth to put around that turtle and thereby forming the land upon which she would live and her descendants would live. So this is one of a Northeastern Native American creation story of which there are many. And you may think of our society as having creation stories as well, uh, a scientific creation story in terms of Big Bang Theory and evolution. And um, uh, for folks of the Christian faith, uh, you might think of uh, God creating Adam and Eve. So uh, different stories from different people, but all powerful. Sometimes we have Native American art that has been recovered archeologically, but that we don't necessarily understand. And these are two examples of, of that. Um, they're both found in the Delaware Valley. The piece in the upper left is found in northern New Jersey, close to uh, the Delaware Water Gap. Um, and I believe it's now at the Pennsylvania State Museum. And the piece in the bottom right uh, is at the Seton Hall University Museum. And you can see engraved on the piece to the bottom right, it's a hunk of sandstone. It's, uh, oh, it's probably as big as the bottom of the seat of a chair. And there are two hands on it as if they were impressed right into the stone and a tremendous amount of work went into carving them in there. The figures on the other uh, carving are, are more abstract. They're harder to understand. Some of them are clearly animals, some look like people and, and some we're not sure of. Um, presumably within their cultural context, these told a powerful story. Uh, this is an example of experimental archaeology, one of those other sources of information about the past. And here I am uh, with a group of my students at Monmouth University, and we are trying very hard to make stone tools through a process called flint mapping. And what we're learning in part, you know, in part we're learning how to make those tools, but in part we're learning that we're not very good at flint mapping. And, um, and our ancestors, our precursors were much, much better at it. And it's a real skill, uh, just like the skills that people have uh, today. And it's not something you can pick up and, and do immediately without a lot of practice. I have a friend, Bill Schindler, um, who lives down in Chestertown, Maryland. And for his doctoral dissertation at Temple University, he attempted to live, uh, I think it was for six weeks, on an island in the Delaware, I think it's Hendricks Island, uh, as a Native American using only traditional technologies, hunting, fishing, gathering plants for a living. Um, and uh, he said this was the hardest thing. And he was, uh, he was a, a very competitive collegiate wrestler, but he said this was the hardest thing he had ever done in his entire life. And he lost actually quite a bit of weight doing it. So it teaches us to, to respect our ancestors, if you will. Now, Native Americans are still very much part of our communities today, uh, but in their names are commemorated in many places on 
uh, on the landscape. And this is a wonderful map from um, the Encyclopedia. I think this is from the Encyclopedia of New Jersey that Maxine Lurie put together. And you can see here are Indian place names uh, across New Jersey. And many of them are very familiar. Hoboken, Secaucus, Navasink and Rumson, Wanamasa, close to where I work uh, at Monmouth. And then uh, further south, Crosswicks, Shaman, Cat's Ion, and Saucon. We're going to use the term Lenape, uh, sometimes called the Delaware Indians. So Lenape in the original Algonquin uh, translates as people. Uh, and I very much imagine sort of Dutch or Swedish uh, explorers in the 17th century meeting Lenape and saying to them, who are you? And the Lenape say in the century, we are people, who are you? Uh, Lene Lenape, which you'll also hear, uh, means real or true people. Uh, a wonderful word um, that has come down to us is Lenape Hoking or land of the Lenape. And that would have extended well beyond New Jersey's political boundaries today. So into Eastern Pennsylvania, Northern Delaware, Southern New York State, certainly Manhattan, Staten Island, a little bit of uh, the Western end of Long Island and even up the Hudson. A bit. Uh, within this group, within this area rather, there are different groups of people um, and there are different dialects that were spoken. So North of the Raritan River, most scholars agree uh, that folks spoke what was called a Muncie dialect and South of the Raritan River, Nami dialect was spoken. These would have been mutually uh, intelligible. Uh, so they would have been able to understand each other, but they're a little bit different. And as my students sometimes remind me, even today, uh, people in Northern New Jersey and Southern New Jersey uh, sometimes speak, speak differently. And of course we could go to sort of silly examples and think of uh, uh, subs versus hoagies or pork roll versus Taylor ham. Um, within these larger groups, uh, the Lenape lived in bands. And you might think of these as extended, multi-generational families. Uh, the area around Trenton, not very far from West Windsor, would have been home to the Sanhican. Uh, the area where I live in Middlesex County uh, would have been home uh, to the Raritan. And those were really the operational groups, if you will. They were uh, the folks who were right there on the landscape. Now a little bit on the archeological history of the state. So if we were doing this talk, let's say 130 years ago, we would have had very different ideas about the history of New Jersey and really the world in general. Scholars before, well, maybe 1850, thought that the world was pretty young, only about 6,000 years old. And they thought that Native Americans, indigenous people had only arrived uh, in the Americas a few thousand years ago. And this fellow from Hamilton Township, New Jersey, really changed that. And uh, he's kind of our first archeologist. One of the things I really like about him, his name was Charles Conrad Abbott, but he, uh, he was wrong about some of his basic ideas, but nevertheless, he persisted and he kind of blew the, blew the doors off some of the long-headed ideas of his age. So um, he fell in love with collecting Indian artifacts, Native American artifacts, projectile points and the like. And as he's finding these artifacts, he's corresponding with other scholars in Europe. So scholars in Europe in the 1870s and 80s when he's active are digging up the remains of ancient Neanderthals, and arguing about the uh, antiquity of human beings. And Abbott believes, based on some of the artifacts that he's finding in Hamilton and Trenton, that there must have been people living in the Delaware Valley for thousands and thousands of years, going back to the end of the last glacier about 12,000 years ago. Uh, and he argues this vehemently. And today, we would say he's, he's right. Um, but a lot of the evidence he mustered to make his arguments turns out to have been uh, incorrect. That said, uh, even though he might have been wrong about the details, he was 
write about the big picture. Today, he's uh, buried in Trenton, um, and he is buried under a large glacial erratic, uh, just perfect for him. And you'll see it says, Dr. Abbott discovered the existence of Paleolithic man. Today, we would see people in America. And these are the artifacts that got him going. Uh, he had been reading about artifacts like these, found in France primarily, and this is what he was finding really on his uh, wife's farm, um, the three beaches. And he looked at them and he said, well, they look remarkably similar, and they did. Uh, it turns out that some of his finds were made from stone that is actually much, much more recent, a type of stone called argillite. But he did open up those doors to deep, deep antiquity. Charles Conrad Abbott, believe it or not, had a nemesis. Uh, all great heroes need a nemesis. And his nemesis was this fellow, Alice Hardlishka, who was a Smithsonian Institution archeologist. And uh, Mr. Hardlishka, Dr. Hardlishka did not think that Charles Conrad Abbott was a very good excavator. Um, and he felt that his theories were not well supported. Um, nevertheless, Abbott continued to fight for this idea of ancient humans in the Delaware Valley. And he was particularly fond of working in this area, which stretches from Layler Street in Trenton, uh, down through Hamilton Township, all the way into uh, Bordentown. Uh, this area, sometimes called the Abbott Farm, is today considered a national historic landmark. It's both some of the most important archeological sites relating to indigenous people in the state, but it's also important for the history of science and allowing for a very deep free history in North America. Abbott is followed by other uh, scholars also passionately interested in Native Americans. This is Max Schrabisch. Uh, Max was a German immigrant. He was very familiar with discoveries of ancient humans in caves, so think of sort of cavemen. Um, and he wanted to find similar uh, archaeological deposits here in North America. And he was employed by the New Jersey Geological Survey to carry out uh, a survey of the northern part of the state. Here's his publication, a preliminary report that came out over 100 years ago in 1913. Max, though, he got himself in a bit of trouble. Um, first of all, he must have been in great cardiovascular shape because, as I understand it, he didn't drive. He bicycled or took public transportation everywhere. So kind of a model for us today. Um, but during the First World War, he's up in the mountains of Sussex County recording rock shelters. And as I understand it, local people called the police on him saying there was a German spy up in the mountains. And they, they came and arrested him. Uh, and it turned out that uh, he was he was definitely a scientist, but he was he was not a, a spy. But later, we have a heroic leading lady in terms of New Jersey, New Jersey's archaeological past, and that is uh, Dorothy Cross. So during the Great Depression, lots of people were out of work, and Dorothy Cross was a newly minted uh, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania who had studied ancient Sumerian sites, and she was looking for a job, pretty hard to come by. And ultimately, she is hired as our first official state archaeologist working at the State Museum in Trenton, which is still there. And she led teams of mostly unemployed men on archaeological digs across the state. Uh, she did this right up until the start of World War II incredibly prolific, active researcher. And this is one of her progress charts. Um, she puts a lot of Abbott's sort of ideas to bed, um, but she also gives us a much richer understanding of the sort of 12,000 years that Native Americans, 12,000 plus years Native Americans had lived in the state. This is uh, one of my favorite photos showing Dorothy and uh, First of all, I'm impressed that she's in a dress. Archaeologists today uh, tend to dress down. Um, the other thing that's amazing, and it speaks to the skill of New Jersey's ancient people, is she is excavating an extraordinarily large pot ceramic vessel that she's literally sitting inside of as she's carefully excavating. So it's big enough that she can kneel inside it fairly comfortably. 
And it speaks to uh, the abilities of these ancient people to produce wonderful works of art, functional art, if you will. So what I learned in school about the uh, first Americans is evolving. Uh, when I was in graduate school, we were taught that the first Americans came from Siberia. They crossed a land bridge during the last glacier, came into North America, maybe through an ice-free corridor, and spread out across the continent, peopling all of North America and then heading south, and peopling South America as well. Um, but in the last 20 years, some incredibly old archaeological sites have been found, some of which are in South America. And this has led scholars to make a couple new arguments. First of all, people probably were crossing a, a land bridge uh, following large game animals that they were hunting. But they also, we think, they also were probably coming down the coast in watercraft. They weren't just walking. Um, at the same time, it's not just one sort of wave of people, but it's at least probably three waves of people, if not more, coming across and mixing with each other and forming new cultures. And we can tell this in part because of genetics and in part because of language groups that Native Americans speak today. Now, before about 12,000 years ago, most of Northern New Jersey from an area uh, that runs from Perth Amboy through Edison and Clark and Westfield, uh, an area that far south was covered by glaciers. And that's where those glaciers ended. In fact, I live uh, in South Plainfield, just a couple blocks from the terminal moraine where the glaciers melted and they dropped all their rocks. Um, these glaciers were at their height over a mile thick. It's kind of hard to imagine a mile of ice uh, and that would have sucked up a lot of water from the oceans and it would have created tremendous weight on the landscape. People, though, the ancestors of today's Native Americans were living the edge of those glaciers and hunting and gathering uh, for food. They were using really distinctive tools that reflect a high, high degree of technical skill, stone tools, and they're very mobile on the landscape. We're not talking large populations. These are small populations that are supporting themselves, again, by hunting and gathering uh, in a very challenging environment. Some of the more famous sites associated with the Paleo Indians are the Turkey Swamp Site, which is in a Monmouth County Park by the same name, uh, the Plenge Site, which is up by the Delaware Water Gap, uh, the Sam's Club Site, a rather unfortunate name, uh, which is uh, located um, at the proposed site of a Sam's Club in uh, Ocean County, uh, just off Route 72. This is a map drawn by uh, the late Herb Kraft, who is an archaeologist at Seton Hall University, and shows us a different New Jersey than the one uh, we know and love today. So here are the glaciers, the maximum extent of the glacier. All of Long Island is really glacial outwash. Uh, this is my neighborhood right here. And uh, But what you should notice is the continental shelf, an area of fantastic fishing today. Uh, this area would have been exposed. It's above water. People could walk around, could live out here, and they did. Uh, in fact, Daria Merwin from the SUNY Stony Brook did her doctoral dissertation looking for archeological sites on the continental shelf. And that is really like looking for a needle in a haystack. And she was incredibly successful uh, at, at finding these sites. The artifacts I mentioned, uh, these fluted points or Clovis points are some of the earliest artifacts made by Native Americans. They're essentially you think of them either as spear points, or you might want to think of them as the equivalent of a Swiss Army knife. They're kind of multi-purpose tools uh, made out of the finest stone by incredible craftsmen. So the landscape would have looked very different. Uh, mastodons and mammoths would have been present in the area just south of the glacier. It would have been a tundra-like landscape grading into forests as it got a little bit warmer. Uh, huge elk were also 
deer as were giant uh, sloths and other animals that archaeologists love to call Pleistocene megafauna. And that's just one of my favorite phrases. Megafauna means, in essence, big animals. These are the big animals of the Pleistocene. Most of them are extinct today, probably due to climate change, though hunting uh, no doubt contributed. Um, some, however, survive, and the one you're probably most familiar with is, um, is the American bison or buffalo, which would be an example of uh, surviving megafauna. This is uh, the Mannington Mastodon, which is at the Rutgers Geology Museum. And I love this museum because it's like, uh, it's a blast from the past. You feel like you're in League of Mysterious Gentlemen or something. Uh, the displays are old fashioned, but they're nevertheless wonderful. Uh, she was dug up in the 19th century in Mannington, which is in Salem County, New Jersey. Uh, her tusks, as I understand it, are wooden reproductions uh, because the originals, one of which you see below, uh, were in pretty rough shape. Uh, and she was used essentially as a display. People would be charged a nickel to come see her at county fairs and the like before ultimately uh, she's acquired by the Rutgers Geology Museum. She's a wonderful reminder of our state's distant past. One of the challenges with doing archaeology in New Jersey is that our archaeological sites are, are not as visible. It's say uh, the Greek pyramids or the pyramids in Guatemala and Honduras or the Great Wall of China, um, the um, Colosseum in Rome. Uh, instead, they're often more subtle. Some of the exceptions are cave sites. And here you see Dorothy Cross again with a team of colleagues. Um, and they are at a cave site in Northwestern New Jersey uh, called the Fairy Hole Rock Shelter. And artifacts in this cave have been found going back uh, to the end of the Pleistocene. So uh, bones of giant sloths were found there. This is the view. This is not my photo. I wish it were. It's really so artistic. But it's a view looking out uh, from, um, from that cave. And you can see why this would have been an attractive place for, for people to live. So the environment shapes Native American societies. One of the things that uh, I hope you take away from the talk is that Native Americans in New Jersey or anywhere, indigenous people were not just living a life that never changed. Their lives evolved. They were smart, engaged people just like us, and they are engaging with an environment that is evolving around them. Uh, so we see society changing over time. The Wisconsin ice sheet, that last glacier, starts to retreat about 15,000 years ago. There's still some traces of it left, believe it or not. The Great Swamp in Morris and Somerset counties is a reminder, as is the Meadowlands. Uh, the environment warms up and spruce forests replace the tundra. And then as it gets warmer still, pine and oak trees replace the spruce, chestnut as well. Um, the Atlantic shore, which had been about 100 miles east of its current position, keeps moving westward. So this is climate change, but it's not climate change uh, due to human activities. It's climate change uh, due to uh, changing rotation of, of the Earth as it spins on its axis and goes around the sun. By 28 hundred years before present or so, a relatively modern climate, a climate we would recognize had emerged. Archaeologists break up this 12,000 year period into, um, into three major periods. The first one we call the Paleo-Indian period, and that's sort of 10 to 12,000 years ago plus. And, um, Paleo-Indian means simply old Indian. Uh, it's not a great term, but it's, it's a descriptive term. That's followed by the Archaic period, which lasts from roughly 10,000 to about 3,000 years ago. So again, the environment's warming up. Native Americans are now living in a forested environment. Uh, they're able to uh, cut down trees with stone tools like this groundstone ax and make uh, make dwellings, make canoes, make all sorts of useful things. They're fishing a lot more. Those big animals that they had been hunting are starting to disappear. Human populations are growing 
and actually reach a height at the end of the archaic period before collapsing again and then coming back up. Other tools, this is a woodworker's tool. It's a gouge carefully made out of stone. This is one of my favorites. This is um, a soapstone bowl. So it's about the size of a crock pot, uh, but it was carved by hand from a very soft stone called soapstone. And um, you could carve this with uh, a pocket knife. So of course, uh, these ancient Native Americans did not have pocket knives that are using other sharp stones to carve it. Um, vessels like this would have allowed food to be cooked in new ways. And that was, uh, that was a real innovation because it allowed for more nutritional value to be extracted from, from food sources. And we think during this period, during most of the arcade, people are primarily gathering their foods out of the environment. They're not raising a lot of crops yet. They will later, uh, but not quite yet. Vessels like this also would have allowed food to be stored um, in ways that would have been hard to do using simply baskets or wooden bowls. Native Americans are hunting extensively, and um, we get reminders of that through tools like this one. This is a, an artifact from New Jersey, and it's really, uh, I think, uh, really surpassing beauty. It's called an atlatl or a banner stone, and it is a weight for a tool, you can see how it's used down here, that is hooked onto a handle and used to throw large darts great distances. Now, I am a lousy, lousy baseball player. I can barely throw a ball, but with an atlatl, I have a rocket for an arm, and I can only imagine that somebody with some actual skill and talent would be even better at it. It gives you a lot of force and allows you to throw a dart, essentially uh, the length of a football field. Wonderful tool for hunting and uh, also uh, a source of great artisanship for Native Americans. Projectile points, what we often call arrowheads, but most weren't actually arrowheads yet. Spears in this case, uh, made from a stone called argillite, uh, would have been used extensively. And they change over time and from region to region. Now, interestingly enough, if we look from Maine to the Carolinas, we see very similar types of projectile points. And that probably means that these people are, they're in touch with each other. They're talking to each other. They're exchanging ideas about technology. They're not isolated. This is one of our most visible archaeological sites uh, in the state generally, and it dates from the archaic period. And uh, it is by Tuckerton in Ocean County, the shore. And what you can see over here is see a lot of shell. This is the Tuckerton Shell Mound. So one great stretches of the Jersey Shore by Keyport and Cape May, and also in Ocean County had huge shell mounds or what European scholars call shell middens. That's because people were sitting here, living, eating shellfish for extensive periods of time, discarding those shells and they just, they built up. Um, scholars such as Drew Stanzeski, Alan Mounier, Jack Cresson and others have uh, tested, probed down into the marshes around the Puckard and Shell Mound and they've discovered that this is quite literally the tip of the iceberg. There's shells all underneath the marsh grasses here. There are other artifacts mixed in. Dorothy Cross uh, dug a trench through the shell mound in the 1930s. Other scholars even before her had worked there. I have visited it. Um, it's a starkly beautiful spot uh, with cedar trees. It's also, I would think, a very challenging place to do archaeology. It has a very uh, luxurious growth of poison ivy. By about 2,000 years ago, uh, societies have evolved yet further, changed, and we have what archaeologists call the woodland period. And here we see uh, people living in more permanent dwellings, and they're starting uh, to engage in horticulture. They're growing crops, especially corn, beans, squash, 
uh, tobacco, as well as continuing to gather foods from the natural environment around them. Corn, beans, and squash eaten together with venison provide a very nutritious uh, diet. And those are all crops that were brought north to this region out of uh, Mesoamerica, out of, out of Mexico, and even points south. So again, reflecting contact between people. These are reconstructions. What you, what you just saw was a longhouse. This is a wigwam. And uh, these are located at um, the reconstructions by John Craft at Historic Waterloo Village. But they really give the feeling of what the landscape might have looked like. Uh, other artifacts, we get pottery uh, at the end of the archaic and into the woodland period. And these first ceramic vessels look a lot like those soapstone vessels. Uh, this is a big one uh, from, if I recall correctly, from Ocean Township and Monmouth County. And uh, imagine how much more food you can now prepare with a vessel uh, this large. Tobacco is also being smoked, though initially it's not smoked in pipes that look like modern tobacco pipes. Instead, it's smoked in pipes that are sometimes called cloud blowers. And these are some of those pipes uh, found in an archeological site at uh, Bridgeport in Gloucester County. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting about them is that they're made from a particular type of clay that is found in Ohio. Uh, so that speaks to long distance contacts between Ohio and New Jersey going back thousands of years. Whoops. Uh, these are also from that same site, apparently disturbed when a railroad was being constructed in the late 1800s. These are very large, that is a centimeter ruler at the bottom, very large projectile points. So projectile points of this size would not have been useful as arrows or as spear points. Um, and the, the flint they are made from is not local to New Jersey. Again, it's from uh, Ohio. And this speaks to, we think it speaks to trade and maybe religious belief systems. Uh, these, are, these are incredible. Uh, they are, you know, not to use a silly sort of uh, analogy, but uh, to the average, uh, let's say, Toyota of projectile points, these are... This is a Mercedes-Benz, a Bugatti. These are really incredible, and they speak to the tremendous craftsmanship of the people who made them. We also have examples. Uh, this is also from that same site. Examples of art that sometimes uh, leave us puzzled and uh, wanting for more. So this is what uh, um, what some of that art looks like. It's abstract, but uh, on a tool called or an object called a gorget. Uh, Michael Stewart, a distinguished scholar from uh, Temple University, has argued that what we're looking at is uh, a representation of uh, fishnets, and that perhaps uh, something like this could even have been used in terms of working with fishnets. We don't know for sure, uh, but it's a fascinating object. Here again, a piece of a piece of art, somewhat abstract, uh, but you can see how it would have. Uh, been uh, mounted on a string and you could wear it. Um, perhaps it's a turtle. Uh, we're not entirely sure. This is from the collections of the Ocean County Historical Society. It's carved out of soapstone. We get evidence for uh, food preparation. So big mortars like this one, where not just corn, but other grains as well. And even um, chestnuts could have been ground up in acorns from oaks to make uh, to make flour. Uh, acorns typically don't make a good flour unless you uh, run them through cold water uh, for an extended period of time or boil them in water uh, to get the tannins out of them. There's more and more evidence for fishing during, uh, during the woodland period. And these large blades called Fox Creek blades were excavated by archaeologists uh, in um, in working at the Abbott Farm by Trenton, New Jersey. And perhaps most amazingly found with them was a very long copper pin um, that almost looks modern in its beauty and craftsmanship. 
uh, presumably was made by ancient Native Americans. And we know that copper was a very valuable metal to them uh, that they had access to both through trade with people living by the Great Lakes where copper is found naturally occurring. And also uh, there is some copper found naturally in Northern New Jersey and uh, parts of Connecticut as well. Um, there appears to be a correlation between those big blades that I just showed you and fishing, um, and perhaps fishing especially for fish like this uh, in Atlantic sturgeon. And these are kind of amazing fish that take our minds back to the to the dinosaurs, if you will. Uh, large fish with bony plates on their sides that spend part of their lives in rivers and part of it in the ocean, they come into the rivers to spawn. William Penn, one of the first European settlers in the Delaware Valley, who lived at Pensbury Manor, um, just south, just south southwest of Trenton uh, in Pennsylvania, speaks or writes in his diary about the sturgeons reaching, jumping out of the water and slapping back down into it, and how there was nothing like this in Great Britain. At the Abbott Farm, other tools like harpoons have been found, uh, and even whale bones, uh, speaking to the abilities of Native Americans to extract food and other useful resources from their environment. The pottery, as we get later into woodland, becomes more and more beautiful and elaborate, uh, often with these raised necks on vessels, uh, carefully, intricately uh, decorated, perhaps imitative of designs that we also see in things uh, such as basketry. Here's a collection of uh, amazingly well-preserved vessels at the uh, Prehistorical uh, Museum, as it's termed, um, which is down in uh, Greenwich uh, in uh, Cumberland County, New Jersey. Tobacco pipes also become uh, much more elaborate. I'm cheating a little bit here, but I'll reveal that to you. These are uh, New York State examples, but they're very similar uh, to what would have been seen here in New Jersey. Some with animals on them, some almost like flowers. The Woodland period also sees uh, a new technology. Uh, often we associate Native Americans with bows and arrows, and certainly when the first European settlers arrived, they were expert with the natives were expert with bow and arrow, but bows and arrows were not always present in the Americas. Uh, we don't know if they spread here uh, across that land bridge or if they were independently invented, but small points like these, and these are all from Little Silver, uh, right by the Parker Homestead. Uh, these are great examples of what we call Madison and Lavana points, but they are they're true uh, arrowheads. Occasionally, um, we get miraculous uh, artifacts, miraculous in terms of their survival from thousands of years ago. So here you see a Native American canoe, a dugout canoe. Uh, our Native Americans, the Lenape, did not make canoes uh, out of birch bark. Uh, our birch trees in this area, though beautiful, do not produce enough bark to make a tree, uh, to make a canoe effectively. Um, instead, large trees were hollowed out using fire and stone tools, later metal tools, to make very effective canoes. This one is uh, on display. It's from uh, the New Jersey Historical Society. It was on display at the uh, Trent House Museum. So that takes us up to uh, really the 1500s, and we're about to have our first contact with uh, Europeans and other old world societies. So here you see Lenape Hoking and the various the bands that would have been inhabiting um, the area we call the areas we call New Jersey and Pennsylvania, New York. In 1524, Giovanni Verrazano sails up the coast. Uh, we don't think he stops in New Jersey, he stops further north. Um, Later in 1608 and 1609, Henry Hudson uh, sails up the coast. He enters Delaware Bay, comes into Raritan Bay, sails up the Hudson, uh, spends some time in the area around Atlantic Highlands and, and Sandy Hook. 
And uh, this painting, rather fanciful, uh, shows his ship um, as it enters uh, the Hudson River, ship the Half Moon. Um, there's a wonderful story about this arrival of Hudson that was told and retold by Native Americans and recorded uh, in the early 1800s by a Moravian missionary uh, working with the Lenape in Ohio. And he asked them what their first recollection was of seeing uh, Europeans. And the story that they told him, which he recorded, uh, said that at one point, uh, a group of natives, indigenous people were on the beach in Sandy Hook, and they saw a new island appear in the ocean. They were so surprised by this that many people gathered to watch it, and it had, it had clouds above it, and it had lightning and thunder shooting out from it, and there were, whoops, I'm sorry about that, and there were people on it who spoke a language they just couldn't understand. In fact, the uh, Lenape say that their language sounded like dogs barking. It was completely unintelligible. Um, and then, then this island stopped and men uh, got into a canoe and left it and, and came on shore. But when they tried to speak to Lenape, they couldn't understand each other. And eventually they took out a gourd. You might think of this as a bottle and the Europeans uh, drank from it, and then they passed it to Lenape, who were not familiar with it. And they looked at it, and finally one of them took a big swig from it, and he fell down. Uh, and everyone was very surprised. Let me take a drink as well. Thinking that he was somehow injured. But he came back uh, to life, and he was fine. And he, he spoke to his colleagues and they all started drinking, both Dutchmen, as it turned out, and Lenape from, from this gourd or this bottle. And they could then speak to each other and understand each other. And the Dutch asked for a little bit of land, saying that they would like to come back again. And Lenape agreed to that. But when the Dutch marked out the land, they marked out a much bigger area than the Lenape had expected. And the story ends rather sadly Lenape saying, and they came back year after year after year. Eventually, we had no land left at all. This shows kind of that uh, age of exploration view, if you will, of uh, New Jersey and surrounding states. Now, it's a funny map in that uh, north is to the right instead of at the top of the map. So this is the Delaware Bay. That would be Cape May. If you go there on vacation. Uh, this is the Delaware River. This lake probably doesn't exist, though it could be Lake Hepatcong. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is, see, there's a lot of information about the area right along the water. But once you get inland, this is still very much native country. In fact, you can see drawings of Native American communities. The first Europeans who come, the Dutch, uh, followed by Swedes and English in short order, are primarily interested in trading. Um, they're interested in trading for uh, pelts, uh, especially from beaver and for other forest products. Uh, but they do start uh, attempting to get local natives to sell land, first for trading posts and later for settlements. And this is an old diorama from the 1930s at the State Museum which shows one of those transactions on Delaware Bay. And I, I like the way this uh, Native American is looking quizzically at the European who wants him to sign a document. Um, both sides uh, were actively engaged in trade. Uh, the Lenape were very interested in metal tools and European cloth. Uh, the English, the Dutch were very interested in furs for the fur trade and in other uh, woodland products, things like sassafras roots. Uh, we start to see new artifacts that helped with this trade, shell beads, which natives had always made, becoming more and more formalized as wampum, becoming kind of a currency, if you will. At the same time, wampum had great spiritual value, 
And it could also be used as sort of a tool of diplomacy to represent a treaty, just like a written document. Governor Johan uh, Prince, um, who was leader of a Swedish colony in southwestern New Jersey in the 1630s, that's located really just south of uh, Philadelphia International Airport, uh, purportedly had an entire suit uh, made out of wampum, which uh, would have been incredibly valuable and quite a status symbol. And this is a statue of him. Uh, relations were not always peaceful. In fact, there are some uh, horrific incidents. Uh, the most notorious of these, if you will, uh, happens uh, when the Dutch living in New Amsterdam uh, attack a group of peaceful Lenape who had camped in what today would be Jersey City. Uh, then it was an area the Dutch called Pavonia, sort of a plantation. Pavonia means a land of the peacock. Um, these natives had come to the Dutch actually looking for protection from other Native Americans who were warring on them. And uh, Governor Willem Keefe seen here, uh, who was really a, kind of a homicidal maniac, uh, attempted uh, to have his troops kill as many Bonape as possible, at which point Bonape drove the Dutch settlers uh, almost entirely out of uh, New Jersey and much of the Hudson Valley. Other uh, European leaders had uh, better relations with the Lenape. Uh, a particularly good example of this would be William Penn, uh, who though trained as a soldier, and you see a young William Penn here in armor, uh, came to America as a pacifist, uh, hoping to find, uh, to form a colony as a religious refuge. And his colony, Pennsylvania, actually followed some land purchases he had made in New Jersey, particularly in the area around Port of Amboy. This um, wampum belt from the 1680s is in the collections of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it's believed uh, to commemorate a treaty between Penn and local Lenape leaders and um, has been passed down for generation, uh, generation after generation. This is a less well-known story, but a story that I stumbled on uh, a few years back that I'm still fascinated by. Uh, another Quaker, a fellow named Richard Hartshorn, uh, was the first settler, the first English settler of what today would be sort of Atlantic Highlands, Highlands, Middletown, uh, in Monmouth County, New Jersey. And this shows much of that area um, after about maybe 20 years of European presence. <clears throat> One of the things to take away from this very early map that was uh, discovered in the collections of a Hartshorn family descendant is that there are only a couple buildings in this area that today probably has, oh, I don't know, 25,000 or more residents. There's William Hartshorn's house. There's the Beacon, which would have been up by Twin Lights. There's Colson's house and Davis's house by Clay Pit Creek. Uh, so really very few people. And then you can see the trails along the water. <coughs> Pardon me, let me get a quick drink. When Hartshorn arrives, he and his family start to build a house. And a group of Native Americans appear shortly thereafter, and they're very puzzled that he is there building a house. And they ask him what he's doing. And he says, you know, he's building a house for his family. And they say that he shouldn't be doing that uh, because it's not his land, it's their land. And if he's building a house, it must be for them. This must have been a very, very awkward moment. And, um, Richard Hartshorn is in a, he's in a tough position. Uh, he can't like call the police or, or someone to tell the natives to leave, they, they live there. And as he explains to them, he bought the land for a fellow named Christopher Almy and Almy was a New Englander, essentially a realtor. 
um, when he tries to explain that to Lenape, they they find that pretty nonsensical. Um, so they say to him that uh, if he wants to stay, and he may stay, he needs to buy this tract of land from them. He does. Um, now, about 10, 15 years later, uh, the Lenape come back to him and they say there was a misunderstanding. When we sold all this land to you, we thought that you would move in and we would stay here and it would be sort of shared land and we'd be able to uh, collect trees for canoes and go hunting and fishing and collect beach plums. But it doesn't seem like that at all. You don't, you don't want us here at all. Um, so if you really want us to leave entirely, you're going to have to buy this land from us again. And the document I'm showing you here um, is from 1698, as you can see, the 8th of August, and it actually spells that out. And it's signed by Native Americans, uh, Tokus, Valapan, you know, his mark, his mark, and there's a wax seal. And found with it in the Hartshorn family papers at the Monmouth County Historical Association was this little receipt, kind of amazing that it survives from the 1690s. And it says, Captain Stout paid the Indians a barrel of cider for me, and I gave them a note for an anchor, and anchor's a large bottle of rum, because they should not drink it at my house, Richard Hartshorn. And then it says, when the Indians sold the land, to accept while hunting, trees for canoes, fishing, fowling, plumbing, this is by huckleberrying and such like uh, that I bought of them, and they have not pretended since to be troublesome, Richard Hartshorn. So he's basically saying, I'm going to, I'm going to buy this land from them again. They haven't been a problem. Um, but one of the things that's very disturbing here is he's also using alcohol as part of this transaction. And um, you know, we would recognize today that that probably invalidates the transaction. In the 1700s, more and more European settlers come into New Jersey. After 1664, an English colony. After 1703, uh, after uh, a royal colony. Um, Native Americans are still very much present in New Jersey, but their numbers are shrinking due to disease and conflict. Um, this is a purported Native American grave marker uh, located uh, in Hackensack, New Jersey. And you can see it has a canoe down here carved on it, a date of 1713. There appear to be a pair of arrows, and perhaps most interesting of all, but maybe a tobacco pipe up here. This is another marker, commemorative marker for a Native American leader and named Akanikin. And uh, you'll notice, even though he passed away in 1681, this was not put up until 1930. It's in the Friends uh, Meeting House burial ground in Burlington County. Native American lives are changing rapidly uh, as they're facing the pressures of colonization. And new leaders rise to uh, the fore. Uh, individuals like uh, Teddy Eskrum and Riquihila, who are sometimes called <coughs> Indian kings or Lenape kings. They did have a disproportionate power, and this reflected, we think, a change in these traditional societies where women often had tremendous power. And this is a great uh, illustration by um, a modern Delaware artist showing uh, Gideon's trumpet or Teddy Eskon, one of these leaders. And I love his clothes because his clothes speak to him as a leader in two worlds, a leader among Native Americans, as you can see with his wampum and his earrings and his beads and his feather, at the same time wearing ruffled sleeves and an English gentleman's coat and what Colonial people would have called macaroni pants. And that macaroni is not just pasta, 
uh, but would have meant very fancy and like high style. Well, William Penn had been sympathetic uh, to the Lenape and had actually gone to Lenape villages, participated in their dances and their ceremonies. His sons uh, were much less scrupulous. And uh, long after he had passed away, they claimed a large tract of land in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania seen here, <coughs> which is called the Walking Purchase. And in so doing, pushed the Lenape out of some of their most productive lands in 1737. These two individuals, Lapawinsa and Tishkahan, painted by uh, Gustavus Hesalius, were Lenape leaders during this time period. And they, uh, they were among the folks who suffered through uh, the walking purchase. These are our only contemporary portraits of Lenape leaders. And they, they're at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Missionaries took a great interest in Native Americans um, and groups, especially the Moravians, um, were interested in the Lenape. One of the things that's interesting about the Moravians is they felt, and this was pretty far sighted for the 1700s, that all people were essentially equal in God's eyes. And they went to great lengths to convert uh, the Lenape. Often, um, this did not have the desired effect because those Lenape then were uh, taken advantage of by other uh, unscrupulous colonists. At Bethel in uh, what today is Middlesex County, New Jersey, David Brainerd, a Presbyterian missionary, um, established a community of Christian uh, Lenape in the 1740s. Um, he ultimately would pass away and in 1760, descendants of that community and other Lenape moved to Brotherton in Burlington County, New Jersey's only Native American reservation. <coughs> There's been a bit of archeology span uh, at Bethel, which has found the traces of houses and artifacts like this tobacco pipe. And um, Bethel has largely escaped from archeological study. There are also a series of treaties in the 1700s with the Lenape that distinguished, take away most of their land claims in New Jersey um, in exchange for the reservation community at Brotherton. I particularly like this map uh, of the state because it shows that New Jersey and New York were still fighting over a border, what today would be Orange and Lachlan counties. Uh, those treaties happened at Easton in Pennsylvania and also at Crosswicks in the Crosswicks Meeting House uh, which you see here. This is a later one, but the er earlier building would have looked quite similar. The Brotherton Reservation is established as a permanent reservation for New Jersey's native people. Uh, and it, it would be located in what today is Indian Mills. Uh, it lasts for just under 50 years when its inhabitants petition the state to leave and they move, some of them move north and west ultimately up to Wisconsin, and others moved uh, west, uh, ultimately ending up in, in Oklahoma. And others, of course, choose not to move and remain behind in New Jersey. This is a, a wonderful map uh, at the Rutgers University Alexander Library, and it shows the houses that were built for the native settlers, uh, as well as some of the mills that were constructed there. One of the things that I uh, really like about this is it gives us the names of uh, some of the people um, who are descendants of folks who had lived at Brotherton. The later 1700s and 1800s see what you might call a great migration of many uh, Lenape out of the state. And this map uh, traces uh, their movements as they try to uh, get away from, in many cases, the settlers who are lusting after 
after their land. Some, however, remain behind. Uh, Indian Anne and brother uh, in Burlington County was a famous uh, Native American uh, who lived in New Jersey well into the 1800s. This is a picture of her house. It maintained traditional crafts such as basketry, which she uh, sold to her neighbors. Uh, other communities were established um, in Oklahoma. And this is a wonderful painting by a Delaware artist called Ernest Spybuck that shows uh, a ceremony and, uh, and a number of Lenape. And I love the fact that they're, sort of, they're waving to us uh, from, from new homes in the West. Other groups such as the Ramapo and the Sand Hill Band have remained in New Jersey, are still very much part of our society today. And this is a Sand Hill Band, a family reunion of the Reavy uh, family. James Lone Bear Reavy, uh, a friend of mine who's now passed away, is in, this, is in this image. He used to be in charge of New Jersey's American Indian office. He's right over here. And of course, this legacy that goes back 12,000 years continues today with Native American descendant populations here in New Jersey and also spread uh, across the United States. Um, and it's important for us to remember and to think about because it helps shape the world that we live in today. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I will try to take, I'll, I'm happy to take. Well, thank you very much for that. Actually, before we get to the questions, um, I do have a little mini, pre a little mini presentation, two slides on how this can also, uh, on more specific West Windsor history related Lemmy Lape items. So let me just share my screen. Uh, this shouldn't take more than five minutes. Um, so let me share my screen for a second. Let me see. Okay, so hopefully uh, everyone can see my screen. Um, so uh, I, I want to point out a few things about West Windsor history as it relates to the Lenape because they absolutely were a presence here. Uh, so the first thing that I want to point out is this map, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's centered roughly around Robbinsville Road, Old Trenton Road, Edinburgh Road, and Windsor Edinburgh Road in the southern portion of West Windsor. And um, uh, note the circle uh, 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 closer to the left side of the screen that's circling the Assunpink Creek. Um, uh, uh, I know Professor Veit had mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that one of the local tribes was named the, Saint, named the Sanhegans. Another name for them was the Assunpinks. Um, and actually this, this creek is named after them, uh, Assunpink itself meaning a stony watery place. And uh, many artifacts have been discovered around the Assunpink Creek, such as Arrowheads, Pottery, uh, uh, along with the National River, and a variety of other locations in town indicating that they're again, was definitely a Lenape presence here. Um, and there have been a variety of state things over the decades. And I, you know, I don't identify specifically where each of these are because you know, we don't want people digging them up, obviously. Uh, but uh, one, one thing to note is that note the circle uh, that actually surrounds the, the other circle, the bigger circle that surrounds Edinburgh Road, Old Tretton Road, and Windsor Edinburgh Road. Um, this is a community, a, a mid 1700s community uh, called Edinburgh, and a few of its, uh, a lot of its old buildings still exist. It was, it was one of West Windsor's original historic communities. Uh, this community was actually originally named Austin as well, after the, after the local tribe, and it was theorized, and it's been theorized that there is a, historically, that this was a settlement of the Lenape, uh, not the, you know, not the colonial buildings themselves, but the general area, and, you know, there, 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 there wasn't much evidence of that, uh, uh, it, it's not impossible, but you know, but there wasn't you know much primary source evidence of that. Um, but we do have a deed from 1703 that was very recently discovered um, that shows uh, several hundred, if not more than a thousand, acres of land below the Aston Creek in West Windsor being sold by two Lenape, Coleman and Papahakona, to David Lyle. And you might recognize David Lyle in the presence of Ken Lyle Road. He's the second half of that. Also, and this is the second out of two slides, so don't worry. Uh, the, there is a land, there's an area that in, in West Windsor historically called Academy Swamp. And this is named after a uh, Winnape figure named Moses Tunda Tadami. And uh, Moses was, uh, you know, his name originally did not include uh, uh, the name Moses, and we'll get into that. But 
He was born in the 1690s, and in 1727, I know that Professor Veit had mentioned, briefly mentioned a figure named Wika Hela. Uh, 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 Moses, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Moses Town Academy had witnessed Wika Hela's execution, but in 1727 by colonial, uh, by colonial, uh, 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 by colonists. And, um, and it got, somewhat in response to this, and also in response to, you know, the growing trends that you saw with colonization, Academy um, wanted to secure peace and, you know, the basic right for existence for uh, his people. Uh, so uh, one of, a few of the things he did was, number one, he learned English. Uh, number two, he was converted to Christianity under another figure that uh, Professor Byte had mentioned, who is David Brainerd, who founded the Presbyterian presence in Cranberry in the 1740s. And um, uh, the time he was also involved in many treaties during the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 63 including the Treaty of Easton that uh, uh, Professor Veit had uh, previously mentioned. Um, so I mentioned, I mentioned Moses Tatamy because he seems to have been the apparent owner of wetlands between Clarksville and North Post Roads in the 1730s. Um, and this area, again, was historically known as Tatamy Swamp. Um, it was referenced in a 1737 deed for about 6,500 acres. Um, a, a community called Penn's Neck was set up in that area um, named after William Penn, and ironically, again, another a, a few more figures that Professor Veit had mentioned were the sons of William Penn. They were the ones who sold it to the area's first settlers. Um, so, so there, you know, there's a lot of relationship here uh, that that time with the larger uh, Lenape history, and we have yet to discover the exact time span that Tatami owned this outside of you know the fact that he's mentioned in this 1730 deed. Uh, but he is, you know, one of us, uh, he's, he's the Lenape with the best known history uh, that has ties to Westminster. Uh, so now, uh, you know, with those uh, Westminster specific things being said, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second, and we will take care of the questions. Um, so, so the first question then, um, and, and again, Maggie and I will be switching off with these. Uh, the first question with, uh, then um, is who are the federally recognized tribes in New Jersey? So the federally recognized tribes are really uh, descendants of people who lived in New Jersey. They're now living elsewhere. So you have the Delaware Nation and the Delaware Tribe, both in Oklahoma. And we would have the Brotherton uh, Indians who are in Wisconsin, but federal recognition. And then we have uh, groups that also have state, have state recognition as well such as the Ramapo, uh, the Sand Hill Band, et cetera. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question we got, I believe it was from the first slide you shared where there was the creation story image. Um, someone who was wondering who the artist of that image or painting was. I don't know the name off the top of my head. It's from a book that was published by the Smithsonian Institution in like the 1990s. And I just loved it. I thought it really sort of made the point, so. Um, the next question then, thank you, is uh, uh, what kind of artifacts were found on the continental shelf? And how was the archeologist able to find them underwater? So yeah, Daria's project, project is just amazing. So she uh, learns of some artifacts that have been brought up by people who are dredging. And then she and colleagues go diving, scuba diving, and they're literally sifting sand on the bottom of the ocean and they're able to find projectile points. Um, as I understand it, it's not unusual for folks who are dredging for scallops and, and fish to bring up uh, bones of extinct animals too. Wow, that's interesting. Um... We had another question about the creation story. Um, do different nations share that same creation story or does it differ across tribes? So there's, there are some similar creation stories even across tribes, which I find kind of amazing. Uh, sometimes they all differ a little bit in some of the details, but the big picture seems to, to remain the same. So um, also, did they build, you, you had presented a number of, you know, pottery artifacts, but did they build, how did they make them? Did they build kilns or what was the process of making them if it's known? 
So they're firing them outdoors without benefit of formal kilns. And I have tried to do this and I've failed pretty miserably. Uh, so again, it reflects a pretty high level, high level of kiln, uh, not high level kiln, whoops, a high level of skill uh, in terms of being able to do that. Wow, it's cool that you've tried to do it too. <laughs> it was such a miserable failure. <laughs> um, our next question is a two-parter but unrelated question. So I'll, I'll ask the first one first. Um, is it possible to find, and I guess Paul sort of touched on this, is it possible to find Native American artifacts in West Windsor and where and how should the residents be looking for them, if at all? <laughs> so I think it would be... Um... My impression of West Windsor is that it's, it's both beautiful but largely developed. Um, so I don't know if there are any sort of active farms, but if there are active farm fields, sometimes things are turned up by, by plows. Uh, often Native American communities would have been near rivers or water courses. So I wouldn't be surprised if people do find things. And, and there may even be uh, collections in the historical society. Uh, of artifacts that people found in the past. We, we, do, we do have a variety of artifacts, yes. I think we have some arrowheads, right? Cool, right. yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the second part of that question, unrelated, but what kinds of parties did the Lenape tribes have and what kinds of alcohols did they brew? <laughs> uh, so I don't have good detail here. We know that they certainly came together and they had celebrations. We think that some of it's probably seasonal. I don't know uh, that they're brewing any alcoholic beverages before uh, Europeans arrive. Um, it's a great question. I don't think they are, but, um, but they're certainly getting together for celebrations. And we think a lot of it's seasonal, like in the spring getting together is the fish are running, so that sort of thing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask another question actually, which is not showing up in the chat, but the, what led to the population decline at the end of the Archaic period? Oh, we don't really know. Uh, it is a great question. Yeah, it, it declines and then it comes back, is the woodland. Uh, I, I don't know. And, and I'd be speculating, which I, I don't want to do if I, if I were to throw something out there. So I'm not really sure. Oh, I see there's a question about uh, were Lenape ever enslaved? Mm -hmm. And we think they were sometimes. So in colonial America, people could be put into servitude, essentially slavery for debt. Um, and there are references to enslaved Native Americans in New Jersey so, and surrounding states. So I think that did happen. Um, th so the next the next question there is about you know my uh, ask you know about the community of Penns Neck originally a farm community and uh, we we are uh, uh, very near to the Little Bear Brook would that be a possible place to find artifacts you know again, again it, it generally maybe maybe not it's 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 difficult to tell uh, um, you know it, it's it's you know I'm sure someone involved you know in state. The, the state itself has conducted a number of archaeological digs in West Windsor. Um, so uh, if anyone, you know, someone there would, would probably be better equipped to answer that. I don't want to, you know, uh, say one way or the other regarding that. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. The last question I'm seeing in the chat for now is about, oh, there's another one that just popped up. Um, <laughs> um, were the Lenape nomadic or did they have like fixed settlements? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so earlier on, we think they're entirely nomadic, but by the last few thousand years, which is a long time, uh, it looks like they're living in, in fixed villages, permanent villages. Yeah, so very good question. Great. And then the final question is, uh, so you had mentioned, you know, alcohol being used in real estate transactions between the Euro Europeans and, and the Lanape. Was it used uh, be just between Europeans? I don't think it was used quite as, uh, as often. It shows up a lot in terms of Native American uh, land transactions with Europeans. And, um, and I think sometimes it's being, it's being used or misused 
to try and lower inhibitions. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful book out I just read called Covered by Night about how alcohol is, is used in, um, in a transaction between Native Americans in Pennsylvania and, and Europeans. So I don't think, I mean, Europeans may have shared a glass if they were signing a deed, but I don't think it's been used in the same way, which is kind of a nefarious way, like not a good way. Okay. Great. So it seems like that's it for the questions then. Um, you know, on behalf of everyone here, I'd just like to say, you know, obviously, thank you very much. Oh, it looks like we have one more. Uh, 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 I'll make this the last one. What native plants did the Lenin Lenape use? You know, especially medicinal ritual and Jimson weed. Uh, uh, whether or not, I guess, whether or not they use that. I think they did use Jimson weed. I have, I don't, I'm looking at my shelf as opposed to the screen because somewhere, I have a whole book on Lenape use of medicinal plants. And one of the most fun things you can do, I don't, I don't have the skill to do this, but is to take a tour. Uh, I did this once in Cranberry by a fellow taught by uh, Bill Schindler that was both medicinal plants and sort of edible native plants. So you kind of go on a walk where you're foraging the whole time. It was completely fascinating. So Native Americans did have like a pretty wide pharmacopoeia, if you will, of native of plants, indigenous plants that they could use for medicine, some of which were very effective. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, again, as I was about to say, uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. And I, I, I know people are writing in the comments that, you know, they're, they're, they learned a lot. So did I. Um, you know, this was a wonderful presentation. And for anyone who's interested, uh, Professor Veit's going to be giving another lecture for us in March on uh, on West on cemeteries, including you know references to West Windsor cemeteries. So look forward to that. Um, and once again, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul and Maggie. Thank you as well. Um, this thank was so you. much fun. You guys have a great night, and see you again in March. Thanks, Dr. Veit, and thanks everyone. Yep. Take have care. Have a great night.